Hey, remember when survival horror died? You know, died with with like a couple of quotation marks around it. Uh, Maybe a lot. Some coming in vertically as well. Yeah. Truth be told, it obviously never really went anywhere. It simply smelt kind of funny for a few years. Trends rise and trends fall, and while the genre output on the Wii S360 wasn't comparable in quantity to the PS1 or 2, there were still games like Siren Blood Curse and... Well, uh, there was Siren Blood Curse. Resident Evil and Silent Hill were also still going, Dead Space was a thing until it wasn't, and Deadly Premonition is best game. And besides, on the PC you had shit like Fear, Condemned, Lone Survivor, Dead Island, Cry of Fear, and Penumbra and Amnesia. The latter of which would give way to a YouTuber-driven boom in horror games. None being survival horror technically, but it would certainly rekindle interest in a sense. Still, it is hard to deny that there for sure was a bit of a shift. Mainly because Japan up and shat itself during the early HD generation. Uh, believe it or not, but games like Bomberman Act Zero weren't actually selling gangbusters and what the fuck is a gangbuster? And fans who wanted the spooky scary weren't down with the big man tough guy boulder punching rut Capcom had focus group their way into. Of course, in hindsight, none of these games were all that bad, but this did require some hats to be thrown into the ring to keep the now tenuously stagnant, dried out genre going. Often coming from surprising directions as well, with all of them releasing in ye olde year of 2012 for some reason too. I, 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 I'm sure that that had nothing to do with- Shut up. In any case, this would totally pan out perfectly and not at all result in a variety of developmental issues and huge budget cuts and overambitious ideas and misguided appeals to a wider audience, no sir. Well, why don't you show us your newest game then? Oh no. Video games typically don't tend to cover a lot of sensitive material. Or at least, not in the same forward way that many arthouse films might. And there's various reasons for this. One might be that the industry is rather cynically run, thus shying away from any and all potential controversy or loss in easy marketability. But aside from that, I'd say that an even bigger reason is due to gameplay always being inherently sort of abstract, if you will. And therefore, kind of silly looking when viewed through a lens other than its own. Like, in most games, you don't really fully notice, cause shit's contextualized well, but even in a game like Gone Home that deliberately went out of its way to structure and minimize its gameplay for the sake of its narrative, you're still just kind of running around someone's house while callously throwing VHS tapes at the wall like a madman. The moment you look at gameplay like that, it can be hard to pair it with say, a rape scene, or tales of intense mental trauma, or relationship issues, or drug abuse, or really any other dark envelope-pushing subject matter. Now obviously, games will overcome this one day, and maybe, just maybe, the people playing and making and marketing them need to learn to accept that camp is equally as genuine or valid and thus not tone-ruining. But for the time being, one must really question the decision to make a Silent Hill-inspired, mechanically goofy, spooky, janky, low-budget, fun-time, horror, poopy game about needing to escort a mute autistic child through a zombie apocalypse while shielding her from creepo adults who wish to exploit her potential immunity. It's French, of course, aka the land of callously shoved in heavy-handed shit, so no surprises there, and also... Fantastic! The juice is down! Now we'll be able to get through, 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 through the grill! It's one of those games. We got screen tearing on top of screen tearing on top of frame drops. Muted colors and alias PS2 hair. Everyone, I think we may have found a PS3 aesthetic. Even by its standards though, the frame rate is quite abysmal, which is saying a lot coming from me. Jank is really the name of the game here, as evidenced by these constantly grintastic cutscenes. The snowball's chance in hell of getting a call through, ma'am. Excuse me? Tickets, please. Oh, yes. Everyone looks like creepy warped mannequins. The writing is so totally done by non-native English speakers that it makes me look like a fucking linguistics major. And of course, the delivery is as stilted as the faces would imply. 
I guess the bad acting can be somewhat uncanny in its own way. You know, <laughs> when it isn't being funny. I mean, bumping into someone who say they want to help whilst not being able to read them at all or feeling like they're lying through their teeth is weirdly unsettling. Amy, this nice lady here really wants to find you. So we can all go on and get away from all these monsters. Like, what is the tone here? Is it comic relief New York man? Is it supposed to be creepy foreboding betrayal man? Or is it the genuinely trying to seem genuine man? I can't tell and it fucks me up fam. It has some mystery too though, mainly just cause everything's really poorly set up. Sky red, zombies in a train, Amy has magic powers and I don't know who the fuck I am or why I have custody of the child, but then in that, when even the soldiers tasked to save start killing innocents and evil pastors start talking about this being a new future or whatever as shit inferno and also giant demon monsters, it certainly does begin to echo some mmm emojis here and there that made me want to see things through. Almost, sorta, kinda, maybe, but also not really. <laughs> Atmospherically, it honestly ain't too bad. I dig the near future, blue hues on everything vibes quite a lot. As there's loads of interesting technology to look at and ponder over, and it adds some character overall for sure too. The creepy, droney, whispery music lays down the cheeky, sneaky, creepy intentions quite well as well. I don't want to be lazy and around here. This place stinks of that pesky infection. And the sound design in general is actually pretty great. Your perfectly punctuating heels will crumble and tumble through the rubble as pebbles skip away and shards of glass shatter. Shit's very mechanical and desolate with sounds of chains, creaking metal doors, rattling chain links, steam releasing valves and moist drippy drips dominating the soundscape. Also, the lighting, whether intentionally or not, gives way to some pretty trippy shit too. There's something here for sure that isn't conveyed at all through any of its other aspects otherwise. So, because modern, also with many quotation marks, <laughs> flickering ones even, it is an over-the-shoulder third person. However, in a very daring show of what, it controls like Final Fantasy 13. You know, in that your walk, your turn, and your camera all have a very swervy stop and start momentum to them, which complements the frame rate and screen tearing perfectly, of course. Structurally, it's a very linear game, chock full of tight hallways, small rooms, and other narrow spaces that get along with the camera greatly with little to no backtrack. You'll walk along the line and uncover an infecto zone, a run the fuck away zone, or a story talky puzzle zone with the puzzles oft boiling down to push button, and sometimes even a zombie fighty with a sticky zone. Shit's set piece based pretty much, with three main mechanics at its core, i.e. the child, the stick, and the infection. The combat is very much in the mold of other horror games in that you hold down a shoulder and push a square to fuck shit up just like Resident Hill. Just like Resident Hill. Though most of it is to be avoided, being that it has awfully broken stealth mechanics that are sound based, which be good given the sound design, but the AI and basically everything else is far too janky to really be able to tell in what state of spotage you're in. Not to mention the game just breaking whenever you die, straight up deleting dudes out of existence. Improper DNA code. And the infection shit is as it is in most games, in that some areas have bad juju in the air upon which you'll hear a Geiger counter signifying that you need to hurry the fuck up before light turn a red and die. You'll get syringes to deal with this and the ability to run, but the main infection healer ends up being Amy herself. You did it! Bravo, Amy! 12 billion emotions. A lot of the more heavy themes turn to problems the moment you're able to use Amy as a mechanic. 
Yeah, you mute little girl who's clearly cowering at the sight of literally everything. Squeeze into this tiny little hole. No encouragement or supervision or advice. Just, just shove her on in there. You a gameplay now. You can hold her hand, which is neat, I suppose, but for the most part, she's still kind of treated like a less respectful version of Huey from Haunting Ground with worse AI. She, uh, gets stuck like a bunch. Though, honestly, it's not like I fared any better. And unlike Ellie from The Last of Us, guards can spot her, only they don't seem to know what to do with her, so same difference I guess. Anyway, even said hand-holding somehow becomes a mechanic in that that's how you heal up. You'll constantly have to slow walk, wait for the dude, hold down R1 to hold hands and mind the level geometry as to not clip. And like, when even the act of just moving around becomes a pain in the ass, I, I feel like you fucked up your game somewhere along the line. And sure, this could be a deep metaphor for motherhood and the tribulations that come with it, but that doesn't mean that I have to fucking like it. Especially with how badly designed most of the levels are. Mechanics like being able to smash window aren't telegraphed well at all, leaving you stuck and fuck until walk through doors with big light that seem to signal, come hither. Usually lead to dick all and enemies appear and disappear at will, while certain sections in between checkpoints will drag on for way too long, making the eventual corpse runs even more frustrating than they would have been au natural. And so, it is with pain in my pengus that I have to say that I did not like this game. It has some charm, for sure, but it is so impossibly, incredibly, ridiculously broken on almost all fronts that I can't really vibe with it. Like, unlike, say, the recent Left Alive, it's not really super frustrating ever, but in that, it then also doesn't have any of the highs to follow from overcoming said frustration. It sits in that interesting but boring smidge below mediocre category where it also puts Silent Hill Homecoming. It's slow, tedious, repetitive, and kinda punishing at times. I wanted to like it, and I did at first, but as it goes on, it'll run out of steam gradually, constantly resorting to the same old tricks with with the same old animations and the same old child needing to be dragged along. It, it's just not all that fun. Nothing heinous either, but far more fun to talk about than it is to actually play. Nor does it really evoke any emotion other than the odd giggle and initial intrigue. But that, as they say, is that. What the fuck am I hearing? Picture this, it's 2008 and you're a producer working at Ubisoft who's just shout out a hit game called Assassin's Creed. However, you've also had another project toying around your head since about 2003. A survival horror game even, about surviving the horrors of a desolate wasteland whilst looking for the child. You reveal the game at E3 that very year, only to then be put to work on Assassin's Creed 2. And Bloodlines. Oh, and, and also the, the studio that you were working with? Yeah, yeah, they bounced out, and so the game exists in limbo for a good three years, only to then be named in the same sentence as the very much vaporware beyond good and evil too. But then, the idea is revived and rebuilt from the ground up as literally an entirely different game that isn't at all tonally or visually like what you had imagined, by Ubisoft Shanghai, flopping onto store shelves only not really just the digital ones about a year later in 2012. Great! So yeah, this is one of those dad horror games. The Silent Hills, The Last of Uses, and I guess Amy as well, per extension of it being a mom game, though mechanically it was more of a dog game a la Rule of Haunting, but it is still a thing. You either protect the child or are looking for the child, both in this case, being that you play as Mr. America Man in post-disaster America Town, USA. He's lost his daughter to the VHS memory lane realm, and so he sets out to find her as he meets some people and shoots some people and climbs some shit because this is a Ubisoft game you guys and hey what do you know this is actually kind of cool it's mostly a game about linear exploration actually legitimately dealing with people rather than running gunning and covering and even the climbing has a legit mechanic behind it being stanima 
It will run out as you run, run out as you climb, and run out as you dust, and run out as you mad. Which this game won't fuck around with either. Quite often you'll only have just about enough bar to make it to the end of a specific segment. Even the very first one saw me running out right on cue. And worse yet is that when you do run out shit'll go all sonic drowning on you with the heartbeats and the music and the needing to mash button and even when you do make it, it'll still gimp your max stand for the time being based on how long you were in fuck mode. And when you don't, you'll die and lose a retry. Con con continue. Yeah, that's right. This game has lives, kinda. Which is dumb and dated, and I hate it, but it does make sense in this particular instance. For one, they ain't too mean, as there's checkpoint checkpoints and autosave checkpoints, and the autosave checkpoints will always be Gucci. So while it's not like the game will just sonic you back to the first level upon game over, there is still that threat of potential loss of progress looming over you, which does ramp up the tension of climbing quite a lot. Especially because because these shits ain't all automated Uncharted style either. You can fuck up, misalign jumps, not have taken a break at the right time, or simply not have been quick enough and also grappling hook. Not to mention them adding in wrong paths to climb down, oft resulting in max panic. Enemy negotiations and encounters are also quite interesting, being that ammo is mega turbo ultra realistically scarce, as are healing shits. So most of the time you'll need to pull up whatever shit fuck excuse for a weapon that you have and try to bluff your way through. I have a gun, back up bitch, I'm desperate, sort of shit, which can be turned against you too as you die in like two hits. Sometimes encounters can be avoided by backing off as well, but then if you do have the right stuff to fuck them up, then why not take their Shit. It's a really interesting approach and far more favorable than the shoot first shoot second tactic that you see in other survival games like say The Last of Us. Shit deals in actual humanized threats here, with limited continues, resources and very long lasting consequences on either front. Guns are legit framed as threatening too in that you can't third person shoot, you need that aim down sight shit pointing your doomstick right at someone who may or may not deserve it. It, 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 it draws you into the gun basically makes you consider shit. The shootouts may very well last seconds, but they feel like decision-heavy minutes that require you to think fast and think good. Though it's not like everyone you come across is out to get you. Some people just need help and can be helped. Some people just want to help you, which they can do too. And hey, you even find a sickly little girl to take care of for maximum dad core points. No way I can drop that far. <laughs> a lot of games from this era were very desaturated, and it's never a look I really fucked with all that much. But this? This shit is so fucking desaturated, it's a bold, beautiful artistic choice, rather than just a hollow trend hop. The bright, white, dead inside light of the unhindered sun beaming down and scorching the skulls of those roaming around this decrepit carcass of a city is a strongly desolate vibe. The dust kicking up from the debris as well musks up the place proper as the asphalt and concrete covered in chalk bounce up the light into it, creating this blinding layer of mist off in the distance. The music is also nothing but drones, scapes, bowily bestial growls and white noisy windy whispers. It's peaceful and quiet, but only due to how clearly fucked up everything is, making it as chilling as it is chill. Shit's so hot it's cold, basically. It's lifeless, but also not empty. There's this real sense that the city is much bigger than you, a crumbling villain that could topple you in any moment. 
A shimmer or a ruffle off in the distance could be anything from a chart curtain waving in the wind to a pack of rude dudes trying to rob your shit. It's also very animated, which is good. Pieces of paper fly by, electric cables dance, flags, flyers and posters hang low and fire and smoke and dust fog up the skyline. Hell, even the complete lack of anti-aliasing works in its advantage, being that its high-detail objects will sort of seductively fade in, making it so that you're never quite sure what you're heading into. It's like, while clearly not a high-budget game by any means, it's still very definitely a title from a AAA studio with heaps of experience, which shows in the skill, detail and general limitations-based cleverness of it all. I mean, for one, it's a game in Unreal 3 that actually runs well on PS3. There ain't even any screen tearing, which I don't think I've ever seen a U3 game pull before, so big props to that. But it's also clever in the sense that, while it might not be technically impressive, it is as a creative representation of a city post-disaster. The plot's quite bare bones and will leave what happened exactly up in the air for the most part, but you know, you can kind of tell. Big cracks, craters and wreckages would suggest earthquakes as some of the people we'll talk about as well, but then you'll also find charred skeletal remains, ash covered white bush and trees fully leafless, indicating that there must have been a fire of some kind as well. Shit like that is quite fun to ponder over as you explore the cityscape. Though as it is, I do wish you could loot more. I mean, you do find some shit while exploring and meet people here and there, optional or otherwise, but to me, being able to rummage through car trunks, trash cans, little shops along the road would have added loads. Not even in that generic ass crafting system sense, but just as a way to find like, you know, notes, more environmental cues adding to the plot, and indeed some items to help you along. The Zetai Zetsume Toshi series does this very well. Letting you find clothing, wee goodies, loot, stories and tons of wacky silly side characters the moment you veer off path. The tone here obviously wouldn't be that goofy, but I hope you know what I mean. I am alive as it is, is just quite deeply linear and I think that shit like that would have made it feel less railroady and more proper exploring. Especially when you consider that whenever they do try things like this proper, it, it goes a bit bad. There's this one section, for instance, which is one of the bigger set pieces, aka a hotel turned massive rape closet. Yeah, women get kidnapped, taken here, and are forced to fuck dudes by the dozen. And as you make your way through, you'll see evidence of this in the form of crying naked girls, women dancing whilst clearly scared to death. You see a lady straight up being beaten and threatened with group rape through a curtain. And then, when you finally get to the person you were supposed to save here, she's shitting on the bed looking all disheveled. Only, she'd be all like, Oh hey, I trust you strange man who claims to know my daughter. Let's go. I know the exit, lol. And then she just casually quip walks along with Quip Dad on his quip path. And, and I like Quip Dad. You know, he's barely a character, but at least he seems like a solid dude, which is a star cast contrast to the typical grump dads of the dad game genre, but Jesus Christ, man. I guess Amy wasn't the only game ham-handedly, ham-fisting, heavy-handed themes into its games, like goddamn. Doing that with autism is one thing, but with rape is, is quite uniquely gross, not gonna lie. You know, I plan in these advertisement slots here and there. And I'm sure wh whosoever's ad is going to appear here fucking just loved being <laughs> played after a segment about rape. Going into this one, there were a few things that seemed like they could become issues. One is the fact that the controls are a smidge floaty. Two is that it is very hardcore realistic with its encounters, which could become big annoy if many enemies. And three, the continues possibly reminding me of why I think we should consider them a crime. And uh, yeah, it starts to overuse the combat a little bit with many forced encounters. If you hold them down and try to get away Way, they'll just bum rush you before you can leave so that you'll have to take them down far as I can tell and I don't really fuck with that. Secondly, the combat is where the jank becomes an issue. 
lock-ons can be fiddly, auto-latching onto whoever's in vision, and finishers, back-offs, and knife attacks are all done with square and rely on contextuality and whether or not you're in first person, but going in and out of first person can be kind of slow, thus sometimes wasting bullets when you want to quickly try to stab a bitch or getting stuck in stealth kill animations when trying to fuck up a dude who you know is behind you but the lock-on won't give. It's quite frustrating, not gonna lie. But even worse was when the climbing section started to betray me too, by becoming so densely complicated that the smoothness of being able to grab onto the right thing started to go right down the fucking drain. And when you combine those two things with the checkpoint situation, the game can definitely start to shit itself a little bit. But even then though, I can't be too mad, seeing as it also has a spooky goon infested ghost ship where the game's atmosphere gets super oppressive while you comb through the dingy tight hallway. And at night, things get proper serious with the thickest motherfucker of a spooky fog I have ever fucking seen. It's really not a one-trick pony type of game, so while it for sure could have done with a bit more polish, I'd say that its strengths and raw creativity outweigh the faults by a fair margin. Besides, most of those faults could very well be considered as design choices, seeing as they do hammer home the tone. Like, there's always just enough ammo and shit laying around in a given area, so you do always have enough stuff to bluff properly. It's just that doing so pretty much requires perfection. And where that can be super frustrating in a few instances, like I said, successfully negotiating dudes to their deaths is satisfying enough to make that all worth it. Even if most encounters begin to play out in much the same way after a while, and that there are also maybe a few too many of them as well. But again, that's more of a polish and budget thing rather than any sort of design incompetence. For real though, I do kind of wish that Ubisoft would dare to do this more often. Valiant Hearts was cool, I, I used to really enjoy the Rayman series. Their weird Nintendo excursions are always interesting, and I quite like this one too. Out of the three big evil western publishers, they're easily the least evil one, and actually make pretty interesting games when they are too busy regurgitating the same open world formula over and over. So, do it, Eves. Embrace the middle market, you cop! Now, when I said that these games would come from surprising directions, I fucking meant that. But Capcom isn't surpri- Shush! I know, but Capcom didn't make this. A and you know who did? The fucking SOCOM people. Yeah, that's right. A developer entirely occupied with nothing but serious tactical military shoot man suddenly had Capcom knocking at their door all like- which is weird, considering that they themselves had just released the simple but cool Resident Evil Revelations and would release the dumb but fun RE6 later that very year. I guess that they were just down for some complete global saturation. Which I imagine lined up perfectly with the desires of the survival horror audience. Anyway, it's 1989 now and RE2 is happening. You're playing as a bunch of gas masks that need to clean shit up, but also it's a co-op game and I don't have time for friends. So I'm heading in solo to brave the really generic, cover-based, third-man shoot persons that lie ahead. Very loud and scripted linear shoot persons, where you're just kinda stuck in place waiting for shit to trigger until all of the available mans have been shoot. It it works, I guess. Cover system automatic, but nothing too fiddly. The sensitivity could have been tweakable, but, but I guess that's what I get for playing it on PS3. And, you know, you shoot gun, guy die. It is what it is. Though, what it is, is like very personality -less. It doesn't really have a sense of humor or much of any character. It's not big broken or big interesting. You're, you're just going through the motions. Zombie hordes take the cover elements out of it and are pretty cool, I suppose, but all in all, it's more or less a compilation of the worst aspects of RE5 and 6. In that it's loud, stressful, you can't always tell what's going on, it's laden with poorly telegraphed quick times and triggers, has many bullet spongy enemies, and they also somehow made Raccoon City look boring as fuck. So, fuck it. I'm, I'm gonna talk about something more interesting instead. Despite the genre being dead in 2012, seeing as it wouldn't officially be revived with the evil within two years later, you guys, it would also have a totally not resurgence at the hands of independent developers. Again, this likely had to do with, <coughs> but it is still quite the interesting little thing, and above all, a time I remember very fondly. Cry of Fear, Home, Slender, The Eight Pages, SCP Containment Breach, Lucius, Lone Survivor, and Anna, all games that I wouldn't play myself, but would still enjoy immensely. 
fundamentally all the same. YouTube's gaming side had pretty much fully taken off at this point, you see, and it did that because of horror games like these. <laughs> Minecraft. And that warms the cockles of my cock. To see something so niche blow up in such a big way while also drastically reinventing itself as a result was really fucking cool. What also made it great was that it allowed people to experience tons of games that they wouldn't have otherwise because free. Which was great for me as I was firmly on trading in used bottles for return recycle whatever the fuck you call it in English money level. Anyway, the top of YouTube gaming is very trend heavy nowadays, which wasn't exactly different back then, but what was different was that the trend itself was about finding the next new trend, i.e. the new funky time indie game. There was a lot of variety going on is what I'm saying. Like, Cry of Fair was a drug-induced Silent Hill 3 but in first person, Home was your quiet little pixel horror story time, Slender was basically a screamer but with gameplay, Lucius put you in the shoes of the scary evil bad, and so on and so forth. None of these games would really play the same and more importantly, they wouldn't play like the established third-person fuck-em-ups what we've seen in this video, but they'd still keep around the many tonal, aesthetical and narratival elements that made the genre so interesting in the first place. I mean, here's the thing, right? The classics may be classics now, but it's important to remember that Silent Hill and Resident Evil were quite strange games in their time. Not to mention the other golden age horror games like Echo Night Beyond, Rule of Rose or Fatal frames weird picture taking ass. So to me, games like these indies are a lot truer to what the core of the genre was than games like say, the official return that was the evil within. Though, uh, though real talk, I'd, I'd take more RE7 and to make type shit any day, but uh, yeah. In any case, a genre having all of that happening to it, as well as two major releases and three not so major ones, hardly seems dead to me. If anything, I'd say that that's a pretty healthy fucking output. And I could also pluck a few classics from the years leading up to it as well. 2012 had the immaculate Dead Space 2, the amazingly underrated Rise of Nightmares, and the dumb fun as fuck Dead Island. 2010 had deadly fucking premonition and amnesia. 2009 had RE5, Fear 2, Jew on the Grudge, in the path and yeah I, I think I'm making my point. The genre was never dead and it was forever weird. Things hadn't really changed all that much, trends just did. And really who cares about those? Sure, the camera angles and tank controls were fading away, but as someone who's played close to all of those traditional games, I can comfortably say that shit had gotten kinda still come haunting ground in Silent Hill 4. Not in the sense that those games were bad at all, don't get me wrong, but more so in that shit was clearly trying to desperately reinvent anyway, so why not lose those shackles? Also, if the survival horror genre to you is nothing but a control scheme, then it's safe to assume that your view of things is probably pretty fucking limited. Limited. Oh, and speaking of stale, 2012 also saw the release of Silent Hill Downpour, a game that I wanted to cover here but didn't because clever segue into my next video, Cliffhanger.